News 2 presents To The Point. A historic inauguration in Columbia. Governor Henry McMaster talking about his goals for the state over the next four years in a term that could make him South Carolina's longest serving governor ever. Well, South Carolina's legislative session is officially underway. This morning, we have lawmakers from both sides of the aisle joining us in studio to talk about what's next for the state. And later, President Joe Biden, former President Donald Trump, both in the headlines this week. We'll tell you what led up to these national investigations. Hello, good morning. Welcome to To The Point. This is the show where we break down the political issues and elections that matter to you. I'm Riley Benson. Well, it was a historic week in Columbia where Governor Henry McMaster was sworn in for his second full term, making him the oldest and likely longest serving governor in South Carolina's history. Now, I was in Columbia as Governor McMaster reflected on what he's accomplished and what's to come next. Much history has been made here and we're about to make some more. Six years down, four more to go. Governor McMaster reflecting on tax cuts and improvement to education while laying out what's next on his agenda. I view our foundations for great prosperity and happiness as resting on three pillars, economic strength, education, and our natural environment. A top priority, making sweeping changes to the state's bond process for criminals to reduce crime. When we do that, we need to close the revolving door for career criminals, keeping them behind bars and not out on bail while they do it again. Another goal for Governor McMaster, raising the starting pay for teachers to $50,000 by 2026. Senate Majority Leader Shane Massey is looking forward to working on new initiatives with the governor. Good evidence of some of the successes that South Carolina has enjoyed over the last several years. But also the governor gave us a vision for what he wants to try to accomplish in the next four. Uh, and that's very encouraging, is very promising. Low Country Representative J.A. Moore says good things have happened under the leadership, but plans to hold Governor McMaster accountable when it comes to adding funding for special education and mental health services. There's a lot of stuff I think that we can do as a collaborative, both Democrats and Republicans, and now we have some independents here as well. Economic investment, resiliency, nature conservation, just a few of the other objectives for the state's oldest governor focused on creating a better South Carolina. And let us set our state on a course that will provide the opportunity for prosperity, success, and happiness for generations of South Carolinians to come. Politically, it's John Bersini. Good to see you. As always, my friend, John, mm -hmm. uh, a busy week in Columbia, obviously, legislative session kicking off. But Governor McMaster's inauguration, you know, he touches on things, education, conservation, the economy, just some of his things he wants to tackle in the next four years. Your thoughts on, on the governor being sworn in for a second full term and, and where the state's headed? Well, so certainly congratulations to him uh, and his entire family. This is really a pretty big deal. Uh, as Representative Pendarvis indicated earlier, he will now be the longest serving governor in South Carolina's history. Uh, you know, education certainly at the forefront. Uh, we're going to hear later about Senator Grooms talk about his uh, bill that's currently making its way now through the state Senate uh, and its focal point in education. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of a teacher shortage right now. We've got a brand new state superintendent of education. There's no shortage of things to be accomplished regarding education in the state. You know, for Governor McMaster, there's no pressure of another election. He can kind of do and say what he wants at this point. What do you expect from Governor McMaster? Do you expect him to be a little more aggressive as he's looking to get some of the things done that he wants to accomplish? Well, some could certainly argue he's been that way his well, entire yeah. career. Again, he's going to do and say what he wants. But uh, certainly uh, it does help to alleviate some of the pressure of not having to run for re-election. Mm. Uh, he might be able to take some positions that you might not necessarily want to take if you are uh, confronting the voters once again. But nevertheless, though, uh, he's a seasoned true veteran at this. Uh, it'll be interesting to watch his final four years. And John, something that Governor McMaster has dreamed about is being the governor of South Carolina. I mean, this is what he's wanted right. forever. Right. You're absolutely right. I mean, again, and congratulations <laughs> to him. Uh, sometimes you ask, sorry, you receive what you ask for. And uh, this is certainly an example of uh, someone whose life dream you know, perhaps is now fulfilled. All right, moving on. Opponents are calling on the Department of Justice to investigate the new state superintendent of education. Her newly earned master's degree, Ellen Weaver, received that master's degree from Bob Jones University with just weeks to go before the no November 2022 general election. The requirement to hold the degree went into effect back in 2018. Now South Carolina Democratic Party is calling on a federal investigation to the timeline of this degree's completion. John, this is something that we talked about as this process was kind of playing out. Your thoughts on this now call for an investigation the day that she was sworn into office as state superintendent? Well, certainly part of that strategy there is now, because basically it's relevant. Mm -hmm. Again, if you didn't meet the statutory requirements uh, as of election day, I'm sorry, as of um, the inaugural day, then again, right. that begins just to pose some issues. Uh, no surprise 
Uh, there are some serious questions there. Uh, we've spoken about this before. Right. Uh, it was, I believe, a year program. She finished it in six months. Uh, I suspect we probably wouldn't see a similar approach from Clemson University or the University of South Carolina, for example. So uh, there'll be an investigation. They'll come to a conclusion, and we'll certainly see how this plays out. Any particular reason why you see this happening on election or on inauguration day versus maybe election day or day after election when she won? So one of the biggest questions, because we had not had this happen before, is when does the requirement for the masters come into play? Right. It ultimately was uh, concluded that as of her swearing in, you had to have the degree. If that degree isn't, in fact, uh, a real degree, then now it creates a bigger problem. John, something we're going to continue to watch closely as this plays out. We're going to move on now. It's the first week of the legislative session in South Carolina. Lawmakers have their hands full trying to decide the most important issues to tackle this year. Today I'll be joined by lawmakers on both sides of the aisle and from each of the legislative chambers. We want to start with Republican State Senator Larry Grooms. Senator Grooms, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Oh, great to be with you this morning. Certainly appreciate it. Uh, obviously, we just mentioned legislative session first mm -hmm. week on the wrap now. So, you know, what are some things you guys discussed? How does this session shaping up so far? Well, we got past the pomp and circumstance of uh, augur uh, inaugurating um, Henry McMaster, uh, mm -hmm. now the state's longest serving governor with another four years. So uh, history making there. Uh, but the Senate quickly got to work the next morning with the Senate Education Committee meeting at 9.30 on Thursday morning. Um, I've, as one of the biggest sponsors uh, in the legislature um, in advocating for school choice, uh, my school choice bill was heard by the Senate Education Committee. Uh, we had a favorable report and it will be debated by the full Senate uh, next week. So one of the um, cornerstones of the governor's uh, speech uh, at the inauguration was education. Right. And so we're going to tackle education early. You know, obviously, both of us had a chance to be at the governor's inauguration this week, uh -huh. and education certainly seems to be a big priority. Kind of talk to us about where you see this going this year, and maybe what are your priorities when it comes to education in our state? Well, our, our teachers, I believe, are still underfunded, mm -hmm. uh, looking at other states. So there's a goal to increase um, minimum teacher salaries. Uh, the governor touched on it in his speech. Right. But another issue that I've worked on is school choice. And so we have a, the bill that will be debated in the Senate next week is education savings accounts. That is, we'll make scholarships available to about 5,000 low-income students across South Carolina. Uh, and you'll be able to use that scholarship at a um, public or private school uh, that accepts the, um, the voucher. It's, some people think voucher is a bad word, but we have vouchers um, for uh, our colleges, low-income scholarships, the Life Scholarship, the Hope Scholarship, Palmetto Fellow Scholarship. These are all voucher programs. We have tax, uh, tuition tax credits available to our state's higher education. You can use it at a public college or a private college. And so this takes a little bit of uh, a page off of that. Where we'll be able to give 5,000 scholarships uh, to low-income children to be able to use at a school of their choice. Senator Grooms, obviously we saw the Supreme Court's ruling on the abortion ban in the state mm -hmm. come down just a week before session started. So obviously we expect that to be talked about in this session. Your thoughts on where that stands right now? Well, right now the, um, there's going to be an, an appeal uh, for a reconsideration by our state Supreme Court. It was a split decision and it was interesting. We have five Supreme Court justices and all five wrote five separate opinions, although two came to a conclusion uh, that Article 1, Section 10 of our Constitution dealing with privacy is, deals only with search and seizure, which is why it was put in there, search and seizure for um, police purposes. Now, we have two other judges who concluded that search and seizure uh, means privacy in, in all circumstances, well beyond. And then there was one swing justice in the middle who sided with our two liberal justices to look at the privacy uh, that's talked about in our Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, and read, into, and read into it that there is an absolute right to an abortion written into the privacy uh, clause within our state's Constitution. And so based on that, they struck down our six-week fetal heartbeat bill. Senator Grooms, you know, quickly, any final highest points that people should look out for in the legislative session this year you're hoping we get to? Well, I, I hope this is the year we finally get a, a, a school choice program. Um, we have the least amount of parental choices of any, of any state in the Southeast. I hope we correct that this year. Um, we also have done very well economically in our state. When the other states were shut down, we didn't. And now we're seeing the, um, the benefits from that. So our state revenues are up. 
Uh, there's about three and a half billion dollars um, in unobligated monies, which means that the legislature uh, has $3.5 billion to decide what to do with it. Um, many of us want to put a lot of those monies into uh, various accounts for a rainy day. Uh, as a big proponent for um, transportation, I want to see uh, the bulk of those dollars go to fixing and expanding our road network. Uh, widening of I-26 from Charleston to Columbia has been a priority of mine for a number of years. And also uh, expanding I-526 um, from Mount Pleasant all the way to West Ashley. That would be the 526 project east and west. Senator Grooms, thank you so much for your time on the show today. We appreciate it. Glad to be here. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, Next, we're going to hear from two. another state lawmaker. Representative Marvin Pandarvis will join us in studio to talk about his goals for the upcoming year. Welcome back to To The Point. This is State House Representative Marvin Pendarvis. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having Appreciate me. Appreciate it, your first time. Um, obviously, legislative session, first week, just wrapped up. So, you know, what are the things talking about? I mean, we've heard education is a top priority. So, kind of give us an idea of what, what's being discussed right now. Well, yeah, it's the first week. So, a lot of it is formalities. We had the inauguration this week. So, you've got a lot of bills that have been introduced, but you don't have real committee work. There, there wasn't any discussion of any legislation on the House floor. So what you saw this week is the respective caucuses and, you know, us Democrats just getting together and and kind of talking about what um, what our strategy is going to be this session and what we expect out of this coming session. So looking ahead, I mean, what are some of the goals of maybe the caucus and, and your personal goals for this year's legislative session? Yeah, well, the past two years I've been really working and, and continue to work on um, affordable housing and some economic development issues. And so I'll revisit some legislation that I passed uh, two years years ago to see if we can get some traction on that. I'll tell you, um, I suspect because of the Supreme Court decision on abortion that the GOP supermajority may try to revisit that. I won't be surprised if, if we see some legislation um, geared toward that and, and that takes up a lot of time, although I don't think that's not anything that we need to revisit. It wouldn't surprise me if, if that takes up a lot of discussion in this session. You know, the both of us had the opportunity to see the governor's inauguration this past mm -hmm. week and some things he talks about education, but he talks about conservation and he also talks about the economy. Right. So I guess maybe where to do some of your goals maybe line up with what the governor said in his speech this week? Well, I'll tell you, you know, the economy is big. At, at the end of the day, um, you know, there, South Carolina has really enjoyed a, a period of prosperity um, in, in the months and in, in the, I guess, couple of years mm -hmm. since the height of the pandemic. Uh, but that's not to say that that prosperity has been enjoyed in every corner of South Carolina. And so while I do agree with the governor uh, that um, South Carolina is on the right track, um, it's important for us to make sure that that prosperity is, is realized in every corner of South Carolina and in every community in South Carolina. Yeah, I want to switch gears kind of quickly. Um, this past week, Chief Reggie Burgess, North Charleston Police Department, announced he's considering a run for mayor in North Charleston. You know, there's a lot of talk about whether Mayor Summey will re right. run again. My question is, is that something you've considered? Is it something you're looking at at this point? It is, it is. It's something that I've considered and, and have been looking at for some time now. It's, it's no secret. Um, I've met with, with Chief Burgess. I've, I've had a conversation with the mayor. And, and so obviously he's got a decision to make as far as whether he intends to run for reelection or not. But um, I'm from North Charleston. I was born and raised here. I care deeply about this city. And um, it would be a great honor if um, to be able to serve as, as its mayor, um, if that's ultimately what happens. Uh, you know, just high level, what are some of the biggest issues facing the residents of North Charleston? Quality of life. Um, I think for the residents of North Charleston, they want to make sure that they've got quality schools, um, uh, uh, make sure that they've got safe streets. And they want to make sure that the opportunities that exist are available for them um, so that they can continue what they're doing. And so, you know, North Charleston boasts a real robust economy with Boeing and, and so much, much of the industry here. And so it's big to make sure that we're able to connect that with the people and, and make sure that the opportunity that's out there is able to be connected in the communities that exist in, to, in the way that we want it to. Representative Pendarvis, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Riley, thank you for having me. Of course.
A former South Carolina governor hopeful says she's leaving the state's Democratic Party. State Senator Mia McLeod campaigned last year to run for governor, but lost the nomination to former Congressman Joe Cunningham. The state lawmaker currently represents a district in Richland County, says she believes the state's Democratic Party isn't working for the state anymore. However, she's not disparaging fellow Democrats and is trying to find new ways to advance a people focused platform. Next on News 2. Coming up, former President Donald Trump will be in the Palmetto State for one of his first campaign events of the year. The latest on his campaign just ahead. Former President Donald Trump is holding the first campaign events for his latest White House bid right here in South Carolina. Trump will visit the Palmetto State later this month, but it's unclear where he will visit, the exact date or time, or if he will be joined by any other Republican leaders. Former President has only had limited public appearances since announcing his presidential run in November. John, obviously this is something that's big for South Carolina. You have both really parties targeting the state to start their campaigning. Let's talk about President Trump, though. Coming to South Carolina, why is that so significant for him? Well, you know, this is yet another example of South Carolina punching above its political weight class. Right. Uh, we've talked about this before on this show. Uh, it's both important to the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, he feels comfortable here. Uh, he's got a, a large portion of his base is in South Carolina. No surprise, this is where he's, uh, I guess, officially kicking things off. And, and John, talking about Republican leaders, we talk about Kevin McCarthy now, Speaker of the House. He coming out this past week saying he wants to release thousands of documents, videos, things pertaining to January 6th. That could impact President Trump's bid for the White House. So what does that mean for Republicans, for Democrats, for President Trump? Well, you know, sunlight uh, is the best disinfectant. Uh, you know, it kills all types of mold and bacteria. And I have got to think that that's part of the now speaker's strategy. Let's just get this all out there. Again, answer all of the questions. If anyone has any concerns, uh, you certainly can make your own conclusions. Uh, you've got to think though that probably would not bode well for former President Donald Trump and his 2024 prospects. Uh, again, his base is gonna stay with him no matter what, but I would think that there's probably some information contained in those documents that wouldn't necessarily be favorable. You know, for, and news for the former president too, his organization fined a, a large amount of money, charged with some, some felonies. So. How does that play for President Trump? Well, again, so politically, uh, not well. Uh, you right. generally would want to avoid uh, being slapped with any kind of you know, fees, fines, judgments, things to that effect while you're running for president. Uh, we live in unprecedented times, and certainly he is an atypical candidate that we've seen run for the highest office in our land before. Uh, we'll see how all this plays out, but uh, welcome to the 2024 presidential election. And obviously we've seen him struggle with classified documents found in his house. United States Attorney General Merrick Garland has appointed prosecutor Robert Kerr to investigate now classified documents found in a personal office and home of President Joe Biden, dating back to his time as vice president. Now, first batch of classified documents were discovered in President Biden's personal office by his attorneys last November. A second batch found this past week at Biden's Delaware residence in a locked garage by his Corvette. Now, the Department of Justice has notified of each of these discoveries and is investigating the documents. Democrats are cautiously defending the president, while Republicans have been quick to attack President Biden after Democrats attacked President Trump's discovery of classified documents. You know, John, what's the significance of this now with President Biden having these revelations? Well, certainly not good for the Biden campaign, uh, certainly not good for President Biden. You generally want to keep your name out of the news uh, right. when it comes down to any type of procedure or process that might prove uh, or be careless at best, you know, criminal probably at worst. Uh, for Democrats and Republicans here, we've got to walk a fine line now. For Democrats, right. if you were talking about how important classified documents in the chain of custody were regarding President Trump, you probably need to maintain that same tone now moving forward. For Republicans, if it wasn't a big deal, then it shouldn't be a big deal now. So again, hypocrisy, though, is no stranger to politics. You know, Senator Lindsey Graham, South Carolina, is calling for President Biden to be treated the same way President Trump has been treated. Democrats saying President Biden has approached this differently, notifying the Department of Justice right away, as where Trump didn't. So some say, uh, it seems kind of a mess. I mean, what's the big takeaway from this, John? Well, so there's some truth there. So again, uh, Senator Graham is correct. They should be handled in the same process. And we're certainly seeing Attorney General Merrick Garland move in that direction. Uh, regarding the actual case, again, and we'll see how this plays out. You know, former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home was raided because he didn't comply to the subpoena. That didn't happen in President Biden's case. They self-reported based upon what we know right now. Uh, there are some other developments, again, that make this a, a little bit different. But at the end of the day, though, 
Uh, neither one of us are legal analysts, but there's a difference between just being careless and being criminal. We'll see how this plays out. John, certainly a lot of news this week in politics that we we're discussing. Thank you so much for joining us here on To The Point. We'll be back next week for the latest news, political news, of course. You can catch us every Sunday morning right here on News 2 at 11 a.m. Have a great rest of your weekend.